So I had a conversation the other day with Troy Hunt, security expert, plural site author, and he runs HaveIBeenPwned.com. And we talk about security in 2021. Hello and welcome to Tech Skills Day. Today I'm talking with Troy Hunt. How are you doing today, Troy? Yeah, hey, Jeremy, I'm good, mate. Awesome. So, of course, if I'm sitting here talking to Troy Hunt, I'm going to talk about security. But there's one other thing that I wanted to ask you about before that, and that's a new hobby that you've gotten into, uh, 3D printing. What can you tell us about that? How did how did that come up? I was this wasn't staged. But I was literally just amusing myself with this little uh, this little clip. Um, well, it all started when I was drinking beer one day. Uh, <laughs> As most good things do, right? The beginning of all good stories. So I had a I had a big sort of round Australia trip over Christmas and I, I ended it with a childhood friend of mine down in South Australia and, and he's a, he's a math teacher and he had a 3d printer and I'd sort of seen him before, but over, I forget how many beers, let's say some, uh, he was showing me how the whole thing works. I was like, this is really, really cool. Why don't you just help me order one of these? And yeah, like I'll worry about it later on. So, uh, so that's how it began. And then I've just been, doing absolutely nothing useful whatsoever with it other than teaching the kids about a whole bunch of uh, interesting things like geometry and, and stuff like that. So I'm getting a lot of fun out of it and it's consuming a lot of my time. Awesome. So how long did it take you? I followed that trip on, on Twitter. How long did it take you to drive all the way up the continent like that? Like overall? Well, the up, up wasn't the, the hardest bit. It's the in that's, that's the hard bit. So for folks yeah. listening to this, uh, Australia is a, a fraction smaller than the USA or a very similar sort of size to continental Europe. Uh, but there's just like nothing in the middle. Everything is just around the edges and mostly just around the eastern edge. So we drove all the way up to, to Cairns, which is up into the, the, the tropics there. And then ended up driving into the middle of the desert into into uh, Ayers Rock, which we, we now call Uluru, uh, and and that was really cool. And then we drove all the way down to the bottom, and bought a three D printer. <laughs> <laughs> it was about right. four weeks uh, in, in total, with with lots of breaks. When we had like ten days in Port Douglas, so we had lots awesome. of breaks. So I so I have to ask, as a security minded professional, uh, how did you feel about sharing your GPS through that entire that entire trip? Well, I mean, all I was doing is just posting geocoded photos. So I, I, I think there's a there's a discussion here that's less privacy or less rather security and, and more about privacy, which is how do people feel about sharing uh, things about themselves? So I shared uh, not just where I was, but you know, there are some photos of my kids and some of my fiance and and things like that. So I, I guess for for me, it's just a a matter of making a conscious decision about what I wish to share. Yeah. Absolutely. So what is everybody talking about this week um, in the security world? Uh, it's Facebook. It's all, <laughs> well, actually, it's, it, it was all ubiquity. And then Facebook happened and everyone's just like, ubiquity, what? <laughs> you know, suddenly yeah. everything changed. So I'm like looking yeah. at my dashboard now, I've had nearly 3 million people to have I been pwned in the last 24 hours, which is about uh, probably about 15 times plus over the normal traffic. And um, I'm literally looking at screens, just parsing phone numbers to make phone numbers searchable and have I been pwned probably sometime today because apparently this breaches 533 million phone numbers. Wow. Yeah, that's that's what I'd read. Um, so uh, is it a, a big deal to have phone numbers revealed, like storing them in a database? I, I noticed there was some chatter back and forth on Twitter mm. about that. Um, should people be hosting this sort of thing? Um, is that something that <laughs> that you think should should be stored carefully by professionals, or or should the attitude be, well, it's already out there everywhere anyway? I mean, a quick Google search, I found it uh, relatively quickly, and I'm not a security researcher, so. Well, there's there's lots of questions there. Uh, should it be stored carefully? Yeah, yes, don't store it not carefully. That's not a good way to store it. Um, so yes, it should be stored <laughs> carefully. I, I think what we got to look at with the phone numbers, there's always a lot of hyperbole around these these stories. And, and don't get me wrong, like it's a big story, no doubt, but we've got to kind of separate the the headlines from the actual risk. And in, in this case, we've got 533 million records. Now I've got to verify this myself. Part of the problem is there's multiple yeah. data sets. So I got given data weeks ago before this whole thing blew up and it was 370 million records. And now the headlines are 533 million records and there's two different corpuses and they're a little bit different. <clears throat> So that bit's confusing. 
But then we've got to sort of look at it and go, all right, what's what's the risk here? Well, 533 million phone numbers, some people are saying, well, you know, the problem now is people get SIM hijacked and then all their 2FA and everything will go out the window. Well, no, because that's a very, very targeted attack <laughs> and SIM hijacking happens, but it's also compared to something like credential stuffing, high overhead. Uh, there was a good story recently from, from Joseph Cox who was talking about he spent $14 and, and or rather someone else with his permission spent $14 and got his text messages. Try spending $14 533 million times. You know, like that is a big barrier to entry. So I'm not too worried about that. I, I think what's more interesting is the opportunity for spam and phishing because you've got this massive mail merge list here, 533 million, not just phone numbers, but broken down by country and with names and in some cases, other attributes like the location within the country and the birth date. So that is a really, really useful resource for being able to uh, spam or fish large volumes of people. Yeah, absolutely. So should we just as a society kind of accept the fact that that our data is going to be compromised and not really be as worried about it? Because one, one of the things that came up is, you know, there's a certain set of folks that are like, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on any social media, yeah. but they they ended up in this also because they're in contact lists and people's contact lists were brought in. So it, it, it almost seems inevitable towards something. Uh, would you agree with that? Or we just should probably accept that our data is going to be out there and, and, and try to deal with it any way we can. Look, I'm, I'm not particularly fond of that term simply because by saying accept it, it's almost, like saying there is nothing that we can do about this. And in reality, there are things that we can do, if not to stop the incident from happening in the first place, but at least to lessen the damage. Now, for, for reasons unbeknownst to me, my data is not actually in there. There are 7.3 million records in the Australia one, which is interesting because we've got like 25 million people in the country. So that must be a substantial percentage of the Facebook users. Don't know why my data is not in there. But uh, if it's in there, and my phone number's there and my name, for example, you know, like what, what can I do? Do I just accept it and go, oh, well, I'll go about my daily business? Or do I recognize that I'm going to be at a, a heightened risk of phishing attacks uh, and I need to be a bit more conscious of spam and things like that? And, and I think this is more where, where the money is, if you like, so where we need to be thinking. You know, we can't stop these innocents from happening, but we can lessen the damage by, for example, not overly sharing, uh, I often sign up for websites and it will say, what's your date of birth? So <laughs> you don't need that. All I want to do is like comment on cats or something like that, right? Like I don't need to yeah. give you my date of birth. If I don't use that and hand it over in that location, well, then that's just one less place that can later on expose it. So we can make these decisions and still use services. I, I don't frankly like the, the premise of delete Facebook simply because now more than ever, this is how you socialize, right? Like this is where my friends are. I've never deleted Facebook because I like seeing my friends who've had babies or are doing other things in other parts of the world. That's, yeah. I'm not going to take that away. I'm just <laughs> not going to click on stupid links if I, if I get spam or phishing attacks. Yeah, that's, that's quotable right there. <laughs> <laughs> so what responsibility do companies have to, uh, alert people that this this data has been breached you know what kind of responsibility in your opinion should they have as far as contacting people or making it public yeah well this is really interesting because facebook is probably falling a little bit short of what we would expect i mentioned ubiquity before as well i don't know if we'll touch on that but that's another example of falling <laughs> short yeah. I think we, we can break this down into two categories so one is regulatory responsibility and and other is good corporate citizen responsibility now, the former is, is in some ways a little bit easier because there's clear guidelines uh, and it's enforceable. In some ways, it's harder because it's different all over the world. And the protections that I get as an Australian are vastly different to the protections that, say, someone in Germany gets, even though, for the most part, we're the same kind of people doing stuff online. I think the, the latter point about a uh, good corporate citizen is probably more relevant in, in terms of what should we expect as an industry. Uh, and, and the first thing is, is that we expect expeditious disclosure. So when an incident happens, we want to know about it soon. We don't want to know about it many, many weeks later, uh, preferably, preferably even not many, many days later. And then the other point, and this is one that I've been making a lot in response to this Facebook situation, is I'm of the view that, let's say in this case, there's data floating around, it's, it's clearly come from Facebook. Facebook 
should provide a facility by which people can gain access to the data which is now in the public domain. So it shouldn't be up to like one person in their home office building Have I Been Pwned for people to go and search for their exposure. Like this should be done by Facebook. They're big, they've got lots of money, smart people, like they could whip this up in an afternoon, right? Like this is not a hard problem for them to solve and I believe the owner should be on them. Yeah, and speaking of Have I Been Pwned, and, it, and uh, I'm a huge fan of the site. I, I go there quite a bit. Do you ever worry about putting that information on your site, whether you're liable in any way, you know, if you go out to these groups and get this data that's been breached and, and I know that you don't just expose it, you know, you don't just list it like mm, a spreadsheet, mm. of course, but do you ever worry about somebody coming to you and saying, Hey, you know, this data is on your server and we don't like it. It's, it's an interesting question because we're, we're sort of living in this space where Strictly speaking, the, the idea of having all of this personal identifiable data without any sort of informed consent or things like that is is not what we want to happen. Uh, and, and as an industry, we want to regulate against this sort of use. I mean, this is one of the big things with GDPR, right? And, and, and that is a fine objective. That The problem that we've got, of course, is that hackers don't really like following those guidelines. <laughs> so, so, so they get data <laughs> all over the place. Man, this Facebook data is spread so broadly. Like it's all over Twitter. There's torrents everywhere. It's just... It's like that you're never putting that genie back in the bottle. So I think the question that we then have to ask is, given that this is now an immutable event and we can't cleanse the internet of the data, what is the best possible thing we can do? Uh, and have I been pwned is, is my version of the best possible thing that I think we can do. Uh, other people have other versions. Some of them, to my view, are way too liberal. Uh, other views of, well, it just shouldn't be there at all, I, I don't think makes sense because in my view, people deserve to know if they've been pwned somewhere. That's that's the whole MO. Uh, and for me, I look at have I been pwned of, of what's what's the best way of answering that question, have I been pwned, whilst not introducing unnecessary risk to individuals. Now, so far, touch wood, no one has tried to throw the book at me <laughs> legally or from a regulatory perspective. I'm doing a lot of work with a lot of governments and law enforcement agencies. I hope that puts me in good stead if ever something uh, uh, unpleasant happens. Yeah. But look, I mean, all I can do is, is what I think makes sense at the time. And we just do not have good regulatory frameworks around at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned the ubiquity incident and uh, they're probably very thankful right now that the Facebook thing <laughs> happened to get, get a little <laughs> bit of the spotlight off of them, right? Um, uh, I hadn't thought what, about that. What can you point. tell us about that and, and what you've learned in the uh, last few weeks. I'm so sad out there because I so love Ubiquity. So I, um, oh, probably about four or five years ago, I replaced my networking gear at home, which was very sort of mainstream consumer grade rubbish <laughs> that I wasn't happy with. Yeah. And I went out on Twitter and I was like, all right, what's what's the good networking gear that people are using these days? And a, and a bunch of people said, I'll oh, go and get Ubiquity because it's sort of prosumer. And you end up with a bunch of wireless access points around your house. I've got a wide backbone Ethernet and a, and a switch downstairs, so it made a lot of sense. And I got this and I wrote about it and I spent thousands of dollars of my own money. Too. Like, this was a serious investment, but it's like, look, I work from home. This makes sense. And I wrote about it and people loved it and Ubiquity loved it. And they started sending me lots of stuff. And I love it when they do that. <laughs> so I built <laughs> yeah. out more and more stuff. And I wrote lots of blog posts and so on and, uh, and put it in a bunch of friends' homes. So I was very, very invested i did some um uh, some tutorials for them as well and uh and that was great and then in january this year they sent a disclosure notice a breach disclosure notice and as soon as i got it i was like is, is this real like literally the first line it was i was looking at it again today it wasn't even the first sentence like the sentence hadn't <laughs> even completed the first line had a typo in it which is sort of going yeah. red uh, and then it was just very, very vague. Some stuff happened, maybe change your password, third party, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> and I got in touch yeah. with my contact at Ubiquity that was sending me the gear. And I was just like, is this real? And he said, yeah, yeah, that's real. So, all right, well, can I help you do better at communicating this? Um, and I talked to a lot of organizations. I don't make any money from it, but I just think it's a really interesting thing to get them to actually uh, formulate their messages better. And uh, and basically, they they weren't in a position where they wanted to accept any help. And then we fast forward a couple of months, and, and Brian Krebs writes his piece uh, only a few days before recording now, which is referring to the ubiquity breach as a catastrophic 
uh, based on the feedback from an insider. And there's some really serious claims in there, everything from a, from a ransom through to an insider with privileged knowledge, insufficient logging, potential complete takeover of people's networks. Uh, very, very disastrous sort of stuff. And Ubiquity came out with a response which was equally terrible <laughs> to the previous <laughs> notice <laughs> and really didn't, didn't deny any of the things that were said but also didn't explicitly confirm them, which I think in itself was a little bit telling. Uh, and again, I had the same discussion with Ubiquity folks. Yeah, but like, just I, I love what you do. Let me help you do this properly <laughs> because this is just yeah. atrociously bad. So look, I think to your point, Facebook has sort of stolen the the spotlight at the moment, data breach wise. But look, it's I mean, I'm honestly sitting here going, do, do I want to accept any more free stuff or or give them any sort of implicit promotion or because I, I'm just very, very unhappy with the way they've dealt with this. Yeah, I'd imagine. So um you mentioned these devices, and I know you have a few I IoT devices around the house. Um, I've got plenty of them. The the lights that are shining on me right now are are connected to my network for some reason, and uh, so because what you do you can. think about? <laughs> because I can exactly. So, same same reason my washing machine's connected. <laughs> so I haven't got the washing machine yet, but on my next upgrade, I'm I'm fairly certain it will also connect to my network for whatever reason. Um, is that something that we should be cautious about? Or, you know, I don't want to say scared that we should be scared of it, but should we at least be cautious of these devices and how um, ubiquitous they are um, as yeah. they're coming out everywhere? And we just plug them in. I mean, I've I've done it myself, just where I get the cool thing. I'm like, oh, it's network connected. I'll just plug it in. Cool. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. think. I, yeah. I think we've got to sort of um, look at it and say, okay, well, what's what's the value proposition of connecting it? So is it worth connecting? And then how are we going to minimize any risk as a result of this? So if, look, I was joking about the washing machine thing. Uh, my washing machine is connected. It's a Samsung washing machine. Uh, th there is actually a value to that, which is that you, you can get alerts and things, say, when it's finished. So I've now got mine plugged into Home Assistant, so that and it plugs in via a, a Samsung Smart Things integration. So now when the washing machine finishes, like myself and my partner, we get a, an alert on our watch, and then the Sonos downstairs speaks, says the washing machine just finished. So it's, it's away in a laundry where we can't hear it. So we don't necessarily hear the beeps and things like that. So this is actually a cool thing, because then you can go, ah, oh, the washing machine just finished. You know, now I can go and put the washing on the line. So there, there is actually a value to it. And then in, in terms of the, the risk mitigation, this is where it's a little bit harder because the, <laughs> the question really is like, what happens if someone pones my washing machine? And <laughs> and the, the risk is greater than just, look, they're going to like, well, I guess they're not going to put the colors in with the white. So that would be quite a quite a feat if you could do that. They might change anyway. the temperature, which I know my wife gets change upset when I do that. So The wrong wash cycle, something like <laughs> yeah. that. Um, yeah, obviously there's risks with the device itself, but but I, th I think the risk that I'm a little bit more conscious of, and, and this is something we learned with, with things like the Mirai botnet, is that this is a computer in your home that might run arbitrary code and might do other things within a privileged environment that you do not expect it to. Uh, and there's a couple of things here. I mean, one is to to VLAN away all your IoT things. I have all my IoT things on a separate SSID, which is easy to do with Ubiquity, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so one of the reasons I like the did like do like I'm still deciding the product. Uh, so putting things on a, on a separate SSID, I can then VLAN them away. The, the problem is you start going down this rabbit hole of okay, I could VLAN stuff away, but sometimes your IoT network might actually want to talk to your primary network. So let's say I put like my phones, my computers and the, you know, the high trust devices on the primary network and then I put the IoT stuff on the other network. I've had a lot of trouble with things like Sonos. Like Sonos wants to be able to, as an IoT device, talk to the mobile app that's running on your phone. So if they're on different networks, unless you start getting really kludgy sort of firewall rules. It's like, okay, well, this device can communicate over this port and this process. Oh my God, it's just going to be a nightmare to maintain. <laughs> yeah. I think that, that the much more practical thing is to uh, apply this sort of zero trust principle that we've been getting so much in the enterprise of rather than just say everything behind the corporate firewall is good and all the stuff on the outside is bad, let's just go everything everywhere is bad. And we work on that assumption. Yeah. So we don't leave things on the network with open file shares that any other device can access, even if you think it's only going to be your own devices. And then if something does go rogue internally, you're better protected. 
I think the thing that gets really interesting is stuff around things like service packs and uh, and patches, so security fixes. Like, how how do you update your toaster? Have you thought through, you know, this this process? <laughs> Good Very question. Possibly not. Is it automated? Is it manual? Uh, I think that that's a, that's a really interesting opportunity. I'd love to see a company come along and do like IoT orchestration platform where it's like, okay, this product will manage all of the things in your network. It will look at the firmware on everyone. It will tell you when there's an update. It will either push it out or send you an alert or something like that. I think there's an opportunity there. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some things that um, us as security professionals, leaders, developers, whoever, what are some things that they should look at when a company has a major breach and they're possibly affected? Is there like just two or three things that, that you should start with on, on day zero when you find out about it? Yeah, look, I mean, there's, there's a lot of really sort of formal incident response sort of guidelines out there, but it, it, it boils down to things like uh, obviously filling whatever hole it is <laughs> that, that was compromised. Let's say it's the yeah. Facebook situation. Uh, and allegedly they're on top of this already, but obviously figure out how it happened and make sure that can't happen anymore. Uh, establishing the extent of the damage is another thing, like how much data is out there? What is the impact? Uh, and then obviously the communication strategy around it. And, and this is, again, what has not really happened in Facebook and hasn't happened very well with Ubiquity. So how do we actually do disclosure messaging to people? Yeah, and this is one of the things that I'm I'm really passionate about because there are organizations out there that have done it really, really well. Yeah, little stuff like here's what actually happened. We are sorry it happened. Compared to, let's say, what you often see, and it's not just Ubiquity or Facebook, where it'll be uh, lawyer, 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 lawyer speak, uh, sophisticated <laughs> nation state actor, uh, dog ate my homework, <laughs> and then, you know, yeah. just sort of misdirection. Uh, everybody's getting hacked. This is the one I see a lot these days. It, it effectively boils down to everybody else is getting hacked these days, you know, so like maybe it's not so bad. Yeah. Uh, I just, I feel like it's talking to my children where you say, if you do something wrong and you've made a mistake, you've got to own up to it and take responsibility for it. You know, like yeah. good little networking company, you know, do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what are some of the things that you see as rising threats coming down the pipe, you know, like this year, especially with uh, the, the drastic work from home change, of course, and mm. things like that. What are, what are you seeing as some of the rising threats that maybe weren't so uh, important before, but, you're seeing a lot more of now. I, th I think it's there's sort of some stuff is happening due to COVID, which is that we've got everyone at home increasingly using services, which, which might be what we classify as shadow IT, so outside the formal construct of the IT department. Uh, I remember back in the day, shadow IT was, you know, like Bob from marketing has stood up an access database and it's like, oh, not Bob again, <laughs> not access again. And that was the worry. These days it's like, Bob from marketing has spun up an S3 bucket in AWS and he's put all the sales data in there and it's publicly accessible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like much more Bob complex. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just gotten much worse there. So I think that sort of shadow IT thing is something that, that has been exacerbated a lot by COVID because people have had to find solutions. And it's not that Bob's a bad guy. He's just trying to get his job done and he's using the technology at his disposal. This year, we've seen a lot of uh, big nation state headlines already with solo ins and then the exchange situation as well. So we know that that's going to be massive moving forward because there's just so much more stuff of value out there. And it does make you wonder, looking at how far back SolarWinds went, like how, I was going to use a nationality here, but we'll try and be a little bit more generic. <laughs> how many people <laughs> of certain countries, including you guys, Americans are all up in lots of stuff too. Not so much us, we don't have yeah. as much money. But <laughs> how many nation states are in different things right at the moment having compromised software that we just haven't even learned of? And, you know, like the 2022 headline will be, you wouldn't believe what happened, you know, last year. <laughs> yeah. So that'll be interesting. And then, of course, the IoT thing, which we've just been discussing and, and what's, what's making that particularly exciting is the fact that it is so cheap to put internet in any device. I got some, uh, some light bulbs from the, from the hardware store a couple of weeks ago because they were just so cheap. And this is, if I was to put in USD, they were probably like $14 or something for an RGB LED light bulb with a normal sort of thread on it that I can just stick in anywhere. And now it's got an IP address and it's in my home. So that is fascinating. And it's, it's like equal parts exciting and scary that we can do that at that price. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining me for this. Do you have any parting thoughts or anything for... Uh... Are technologists out there? 
Look, I just think this is a, a fascinating industry and it's it's massively understaffed as well. It, it's something that that anyone with, uh, particularly anyone with a technical background, but really there's a lot of people in InfoSec from all sorts of different backgrounds, but it's something that most people can pivot into fairly easily if you are a developer, an IT pro, or something like that. Uh, and it is a, just a fascinating, exciting industry and it's it just generally uh, makes me excited every morning to get up and see what's going to be in my inbox. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, thank you very much. No worries. Thank you for having me.